let's go to our lesson for today. I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And we're only going to look at the first four verses today. But there's quite a bit contained in a small section very often in the Bible. Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 4. And let's read them first, and then we'll go back over it. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Okay. Notice verse 1 says, For the law, having a shadow, <clears throat> it says, and not the very image of the things. So the image, then, is the real thing. There's a difference between symbolism versus substance. Look back, if you will, at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4. And I'll call your attention to one verse there. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. It says, In whom the God of this world, that's Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And then go back to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Notice there verse 3. Speaking of Christ, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ was, and is, and always will be, God himself in human form. And uh, there should be an amen on it. In there. Amen. He is, and was, and always will be, God in human form. The law of Moses and the Levitical priesthood had no permanent substance. Um, Paul writes in Romans 8, verse 3, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. The law was a temporary uh, expedient. Uh, it served a purpose until Christ came. Go back, if you will, to Galatians chapter 3. <coughs> Galatians 3. Now, at the, at the risk of sounding arrogant and boastful and braggadocio, when people turn into our videos or our sermons, generally speaking, they receive more Bible in the space of a half an hour than they ever received in 45 years at the church they probably went to. Yeah. It's, it's a sad commentary on the state of quote-unquote Christianity in the United States, that everybody's uh, preoccupied and consumed with the next church event, the next church social, the next uh, music concert, um, the men's uh, boys, boys' day out on their motorcycle club, right? You go to any Calvary Chapel around here, and they've got the motorcycle ministry, the gardening ministry. It's just the guy that picks up the leaves and, and rakes the, that mows the grass. He's, he's a minister. There's the parking lot ministry. Hey, park over there, pal. No, park over there. You know, the motorcycle ministry, the kung fu ministry, the martial arts ministry. I've seen all of these things promoted at different Calvary Chapels, and not a Bible uh, verse reference to in either one of them, any one of them. Everything's a ministry. All you have to do is add the word ministry onto it, and you can justify whatever you want to do. Whatever secular um, hobby you enjoy, just put the word ministry on the end of it. No, it's Christian. Yoga ministry. Suddenly, suddenly it's... <coughs> right, there should be the bartending ministry. Yoga ministry. Yeah. Right, yoga ministry. Oh, yeah. Water 
Brother, Brother Lee, I gave him a badge years ago called Water Balloon Minister because <laughs> he, would fill up, he would fill up water balloons and entertain the kids about 15 years ago. So I got him a badge. He's an official water balloon ministry. Ordained minister. Hey, I tell you what. This is just an aside. I'll get back to this in just a moment. What if a church were to, and I'm, I shouldn't be saying this because there's bound to be some church that takes this seriously. Rather than full immersion in uh, our baptismal, rather than sprinkling on the forehead, like a lot of liberal churches do, what if we set up one of those dunking booths, right? Oh, there you go. And uh, we put the new convert on the bench, and everybody in the church gets to throw at the target, and whoever, whoever hits that target and launches that person down into the water, you baptize them. <laughs> <laughs> or we could have a super soaker or super soaker, soaker, right? Yes, yeah, super soaker. Or we could bombard them with water balloons until they're completely drenched and they're baptized that way. Now don't, now I shouldn't say those things because there's bound to be some nut who says, I'm going to start a church and do that. I'm going to start a church where we baptize with super soakers and every chair in the auditorium is a recliner. Yes. With a cup holder and sure. place for your chips. <laughs> Dr. Ruckman used to joke about that. People would say, we did this and that. He said, well, you know, we started bringing belly dancers to our Sunday night services, and the crowds have really increased. <laughs> you know, you got to be absurd. You have to fight absurdity often by being absurd. But okay, let's get back to our lesson here. Galatians chapter... Uh, 3, look at verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come in whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So the law and the commandments served a purpose until Jesus Christ came. They were foreshadows of Jesus Christ. They were uh, anticipations of the Lord Jesus Christ, although the people bringing the sacrifices and making the offerings probably had no concept of that yet. These guys that get on the radio and say, well, people in the Old Testament were saved by looking forward to the cross of Calvary. Where? When? Show me a verse that says that in the Old Testament. There's not one. They were saved by obeying what they were told to do at the time. Mm -hmm. We look back at it now with the hindsight of the New Testament and the Lord Jesus, and we can see those things were um, uh, anticipations of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They look forward to the soon come, the eventual coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were pre previews, uh, foreshadows of His coming into the world and one one day dying for sin. But they didn't know it at the time. Their righteousness was established by their degree of obedience to what they had been told at that time. But um, obedience to the laws and commandments uh, couldn't get, give someone salvation, nor could it give them assurance of salvation. That's why verse 1 in our text says the sacrifices could never um, make the comers thereunto, the ones offering something, perfect. Look at verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. We've commented on this subject already, but uh, look back at chapter 7 and verse uh, 19. Chapter 7, verse 19. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. At chapter 7, verse 27. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices for his own sins, and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. And also chapter 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit uh, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You know, today, a saved Christian should have no more conscience, and I, what I mean by that is a guilty conscience, about sins he committed in his past. Amen. As Amen. long as he's trusting in the work of the great high priest, Jesus yes. Christ, yes. on his behalf. And that's what the Lord Jesus is called back in chapter 3, verse 1. He's called our high priest. 
verse 3 in our text here. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. This should be all self-explanatory, the animal sacrifices. Uh, it was a system very much like Roman Catholicism in the Old Testament. If you offered a lamb or a dove by the Levites for your sin, you would be forgiven of that sin. You would show your obedience to God, and you would be cleared from the, the uh, guilt, guiltiness of that sin, or the, the consequence of that sin, until the next time. It was only good until the next time. A new sacrifice would then be necessary. Now, if you're a Roman Catholic, you're supposed to believe that the bread and the wine are changed by the authority of the priest. Those elements are changed by the authority of the priest into the, into the actual human flesh and human blood of the Lord Jesus. It's a doctrine they call the, the doctrine of transubstantiation, changing the substance. You get Christ in you by actually eating his flesh. And if you're lucky enough, the priest will let you drink the wine. And I mentioned last week, or I asked last week, why is the wine still alcoholic if it's been transformed into now the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? But you are then said to be in a state of grace once you've received Holy Communion. The logical question would then be, are you no longer in a state of grace once the processes of digestion and absorption and elimination have done their job? Will all of those graces now be gone? And I would suppose the logical answer would be yes. And the devout and loyal Roman Catholic would answer and say, that's why someone should go to Mass and receive communion every day to maintain that state. Let me read to you something. This is a paperback. I had a, a newer copy and it disappeared. And Michelle was nice enough to find this on Amazon a couple days ago. The Faith of Millions by an old uh, Irish priest named uh, John O'Brien, PhD from Notre Dame. This paperback book was published in 1938, so it's 81 years old. And I found the pertinent page that I wanted to read to you today. This is on the power of a priest to consecrate the bread and the wine. This is one priest describing the role of the priesthood and defining what he and his other priests pretend to do or claim to do. The supreme power of the priestly office is the power of consecrating. Quote, no act is greater, says St. Thomas. That's not the Apostle Thomas, that's another Thomas. No act is greater than the consecration of the body of Christ. In this essential phase of the sacred ministry, the power of the priest is not surpassed by that of the bishop, the archbishop, the cardinal, or the pope. Indeed, it is equal to that of Jesus Christ. For in this role, the priest speaks with the voice and the authority of God himself. When the priest pronounces the tremendous words of consecration, he reaches up into the heavens, brings Christ down from his throne, and places him upon our altar to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of man. It is a power greater than that of monarchs and emperors. It is greater than that of saints and angels greater than that of seraphim and cherubim. Indeed, it is greater even than the power of the Virgin Mary. For while the Blessed Virgin was the human agency by which Christ became incarnate a single time, the priest brings Christ down from heaven and renders him present on our altar as the eternal victim for the sins of man. Not once, but a thousand times. The priest speaks, and lo, Christ, the eternal and omnipotent God, bows his head in humble obedience 
to the priest's command. And he goes on and says, No wonder that the name which spiritual writers are especially fond of applying to the priest is that of Alter Christus. For the priest is and should be another Christ. Brother Hogan commended me for having books that I could quote directly from to make my point from time to time. And I appreciated his uh, observing that. I just don't want, I don't want to lose that copy. You say, well, how could someone be so pompous, so proud, so arrogant, so presumptuous, and assume that they have power they claim is equal to that of Jesus Christ, where they can order Jesus Christ to come down and turn him into, or turn the bread and wine into his body, and sacrifice him once again. Well, pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall, and pride was the sin of Satan in the garden. You read about the anointed chair which covereth the book of Ezekiel, until iniquity was iniquity was found in thee. Through pride he was cast down out of heaven, out of the third heaven. And so someone who follows that pattern, follows that uh, formula or format, is uh, more closely following Satan than they are God. A similar observation about the state of grace could be made uh, about the confession, concerning the confessional. This is called the sacrament of reconciliation. By the authority of the priest, you are reconciled with God once again when you confess your sins and when you accept the priest's penance uh, or instruction for you to follow. And you are also said to be in a state of grace at that moment, following that. But the clear conscience, and we talked about the conscience, the clear conscience that you would leave the confessional with, presumably, would be immediately defiled as soon as you sin or as soon as you think about sinning. Your conscience is no longer pure. There have been a thousand jokes about the confessional, the Catholic confessional, the, the actions of the penitent person, the person confessing, the actions of the priest, the conversations. Father Charles Chinnicky was a French-Canadian priest a uh, 150 years ago. <laughs> And he wrote his story in, after his conversion to Christ called 50 Years in the Church of Rome. Church, quote, unquote. And he wrote another uh, uh, follow-up book called The Priest, the Woman, and the Confessional about the secrets that are told and revealed to a Catholic priest in the confessional by the church members and how priests would use that information to manipulate or to take advantage of, in, in those days, the women of the church you've talked about. But uh, we've seen in recent decades, it's not just something limited to a few cases here, isolated cases here and there, between a priest and some women in the church. This is not a big, this, this in the empire where our church is located, where I work, is not a huge area. But it's, I guess, a, you could say it's a microcosm of the Catholic church, broadly speaking, and in the last 32 years of working in the funeral business, I have met priests who tell me about their cigar habit, their love of brandy, and their love of pornography back at the rectory. Wow. I knew a priest who uh, passed away now. He was kicked out of his church because some woman complained that he was coming on too personally with her. I know another priest who had been at that same church before the first priest, and he was asked to leave because of his own sexual problems. He ended up in Northern California and left that parish and came back down here to the same church, and he's an openly avowed homosexual. When he left his former church in, I think, Berkeley, California, uh, they, the people were sad to see him go. And uh, it, it, the newspaper article described his open uh, admitting, uh, admittance of his homosexuality. Admission, I suppose, of his homosexuality. 
I've heard, I've heard Catholic priests get done with their mass and then want to tell me a dirty joke while we're driving in the hearse over to the cemetery. I've been sitting in, I've been at funerals on three different occasions where the priest is consecrating the bread and wine, turning it into the body and blood of Christ and saying, uh, God, we offer you this life-saving bread, this living cup, uh, and he's getting ready to all break the bread and thus break Christ once again as a sacrifice. And uh, they, the Council of Trent, and I was going to bring the reference book, but I didn't bring it this morning. The <clears throat> Council of Trent said that contained in the uh, host, the bread, is the entire Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. This book, The Faith of Man, said, says the same thing. Body, blood, soul, and divinity, the entire power and virtue of Jesus Christ. Well, if it contains the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, shouldn't it contain his healing virtues as well? And during the Mass, on three different occasions, somebody was clutching their chest with a heart attack or shortness of breath in the, by the third, fourth, fifth rows. Rather than give the guy the wafer and the wine to get him well, they call for an ambulance. You're not going to give someone something that can heal him who actually needs it. That's like Oral Roberts who calls for ambulance when people get injured in his crusades or Benny Hinn. Same thing. You say, well, you sure mock Catholicism a lot. Well, Catholic, Catholic people are like any other human being. Human nature wants to think, I can do it all. You know, they listen to jerks like um, uh, Frank Sinatra singing, I did it my way. That's the theme song of everybody in lands in hell. I did it my way. But they think somehow I can save myself. There's something I can do. I'll trust the religion. I'll trust the priest. I'll trust his actions to, to mediate between me and God. They'll take care of what I need. So there's very little required on my part. But you don't get a state of grace by doing some religious thing and then trying to maintain it by doing it every, every day, every day, every day, every day, hoping that if I should die, it'll be one during one of those periods where I just got forgiven of my sins and I haven't done anything bad yet, I haven't had any dirty thoughts, or I just took the wafer and I haven't gone to the bathroom yet and I still have the state of grace uh, abiding on me. What a crazy uh, religion, what a crazy thing to think of. Say, boy, you're sure sacrilegious. Why not? There's nothing special about them. They're the oldest cult in the world. They've been at yeah. it longer than everybody else. Yeah. So they've uh, they've earned criticism much more than everybody else. JWs, Mormons, those are small potatoes next to the errors of Roman Catholicism. But the saved, born again, regenerated child of God never has to doubt. <laughs> whether he's saved today, might lose it tomorrow, or he was saved yesterday, but he might have lost it between yesterday and today. You're saved for sure, for certain, and forever with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, the opposite of eternal security has to be eternal insecurity. Maybe I lost it. Maybe um, my salvation, the security of my salvation is in jeopardy by something I can do or something I might do in the future, some sin I might commit. Listen, you and I don't fully understand everything God did when he saved us. I don't. Right. I can read the word of God and understand what the Bible tells me. You know how much God had to overlook in you and your nature and your makeup and your composure and every action you ever committed, every thought you ever had, every idle word you ever spoke before. You don't even have a list of all those things. You know how much he had to overlook and forgive and pass over and wash clean with his own blood in, to, in order to save your soul? You have no concept of everything he did. You have very, any idea of how much he's prepared for you? I have not seen or ear heard, either have entered in the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him, 1 Corinthians 10, 9. You have no concept of everything that waits you when this life is over. So if you don't know all of the things that Christ did for you, has prepared for you, and wants to do for you now, how is it you can presume to undo all of it 
with a sin on your part. Some sin you might commit, you'll, you're in jeopardy of undoing all of it. You don't even know what he did. <coughs> but you're smart enough to think you can undo it? As I said, only the Savior can save. You can't save yourself. And nor are you expected to maintain it by your own good efforts. If your good efforts couldn't uh, obtain it, then your efforts aren't good enough to maintain That's it. Right. <laughs> but Satan wants you to think that uh, there's something you have to do in order to be saved first and saved from your sins in order to go to heaven. Or that the promise of heaven might be uh, in jeopardy because of something you do later on. Notice verse 4 in this chapter. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. No, it's not. If it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, let me say it's not possible for bread and wine, fermented booze, <laughs> a piece of bread stamped out on a bakery press, uh, to take away your sins either. Look back, if you will, at uh, chapter 9. Chapter 9, and start there at verse 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. The bloody sacrifices of the animals, the bulls, the goats, the lambs, the turtle doves, at the tabernacle and then later in the temple, uh, could never take away sin. They couldn't uh, cleanse sin from your permanent record, like purging the criminal file of some person at the police in the police files. They could only uh, re they were only able to remit your sins, like someone who with cancer whose cancer is now in remission. They could put them uh, the penalties under remission. The, the cancer is still there, it just is lying dormant and inactive, waiting for something to trigger it in the future. What you need is that thing to be fully extracted from you, successfully, so it doesn't spread uh, into you ever again. Go back, if you will, to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. So the blood of the animals, the blood of the lambs and the bulls, the sacrifices, could never take away sin. They could only remit them. They would stave off the, the ultimate punishment for those sins. Uh, your sin would be forgiven at the time when you committed the sacrifice, performed the sacrifice, rather, that God had commanded. But that matter was still on your permanent record. What you needed was something that could take it away yes. permanently. This is where the Lord Jesus is far superior to all the animals. And let me, for the sake of repetition and, and illustration, let me illustrate that point again. God commanded man to bring an animal to sacrifice. Bull, bull uh, uh, goat, calves, rams, lambs, turtle doves. And man didn't know what they Symbolized, He didn't know what they prefigured and foreshadowed precisely. His righteousness was measured by doing what he was told at the time. But like this verse just said, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. They could only put them in remission until the next time then another sacrifice is need, needed to be made. What man needed was a sacrifice that was not only equal to the animals, but far greater than the mm. animals in value. Mm. And in so doing, that victim could be sacrificed once, and that would be sufficient. You wouldn't have to sacrifice that person or that victim ever again. And this was the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Look at John 1, verse 29, a great verse. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Christ takes away the sin, so it's no longer on your permanent record, and I think our PA system is cutting out on me here. It's no longer on your permanent record. Uh, God sees you now, and He sees you covered clean with the righteousness and the virtue and the purity of Jesus Christ. Amen. His righteousness is accredited to you, put up on you, and your sins were put upon Him in that great transaction I mentioned during our church hour, and you go from sinner to saint that fast. Hmm. You know, we talk about the, the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, and the catching away of the saints that fast. I would posit that it's the twinkling of an eye much quicker than a snap of a finger that transforms you from sinner to saint. Mm. That sounds like about the way God would do it. You ever heard that definition of a moment? What is a moment? How do you define a moment? A moment is the length of time between when the light in front of you turns green and the guy behind you starts honking his horn for you to come. <laughs> That's a moment. But I would, su I would suggest that, that uh, the transformation uh, of sinner to saint is much quicker than that. I'm glad that God saved me. I'm glad yes. that I was able to go from sinner to saint as a little boy. And um, consequently, I only know having grown up as a Christian. I don't remember much before that when I was four or five years old. I knew enough when I was six, however, that I had disobeyed my dad and my mom. And if that counted as sin, then I knew I was guilty. And that's all I needed to know. That if God had a right to judge sinners, then that included me one day. And so when my dad gave the invitation call, I went forward under his preaching and got saved. And I say this a lot, and I, I don't... I'm not overstating it. I'm not exaggerating using hyperbole. It's, that is the most vivid memory of my early childhood. The day that I got saved. I don't remember much before that. <clears throat> I was about, uh, how many remember the, uh, well, the younger, everybody here younger uh, wouldn't know her, but uh, Ethel Waters, the old actress, black actress back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and she was a believer and she would appear on Billy Graham's crusades quite a bit in the 50s and 60s. I remember I must have been about four or five years old. My dad and mom knew Ethel Waters. They uh, lived with her when my dad was a Bible student. I think my mother helped cook for her and things of that kind. And then after I was born, I guess my sister was probably with us too, but my parents took us to meet Ethel Waters in her home. And I must have only been about four or five years old. But I remember seeing this older black lady sitting in a chair in front of me. I, I didn't know who she was. I have that memory, and the day that I got saved, and uh, might have been before or after, might have been shortly after that, we went, um, the pastor Underhill that was here at our church at the time, we went with he and his wife down to Clifton's Cafeteria for lunch one Sunday afternoon. I was probably six years old. It might have been before I even got saved. And when we came out of the restaurant, by the way, that's the only time I ever went to Clifton's in my entire life. <laughs> the restaurant's still there, still in operation. When we came out of the restaurant, right across the street, there was a whole bunch of Hare Krishnas in their tangerine robes, the shaved heads and the little jet of hair sticking out of their head. Mm -hmm. They were playing their upright bass and their cymbals and chanting something or other. I thought, what a bunch of weird-looking people. <laughs> and they will—they are—they really were weird-looking people. 
I went to the LA County Fair, I went to a booth, and the Hare Krishnas were making a presentation. They had pictures on the walls of all these different famous vegetarians throughout history, right? That's what they were promoting. But the guy behind the counter had one of those shaved heads with this little tail of hair sticking out of the back. And there was some interested person up at, at the counter looking at the, the wares this guy was selling. And I just couldn't stand uh, standing there watching this guy be duped. I said, listen, be careful what you believe or you'll end up with a haircut like that guy has. <laughs> and I walked off. <laughs> I walked up rather quickly because I didn't want the guy to follow me. <laughs> but I'm glad that I got saved. I'm glad that that's the most vivid memory of my early childhood. So that means all the sinning I ever did growing up, I did as a Christian. <laughs> I guess that's the only way to look at it. But, but I had already been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. I had already gone through the spiritual circumcision. My flesh and my soul no longer joined together. And uh, my name is already in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes. There's already part of me seated in heaven uh, yes. with Jesus Christ in heavenly places. And it's a real blessing to know that you're saved. It's a blessing to know that your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life mm. that can never be taken out. Mm. And no matter what you do, the worst thing that will ever happen to you is you die and you go to heaven to be with the one who loved you enough to die for you first. 